Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. And here on my channel, as you know, we do lots of conversations all on the Beatles. We have special guests that we welcome on, podcasters, authors, people who have worked with the Beatles. And we have two very <coughs> special guests to welcome to our show this time. Um, even though I've interviewed him several times, this is the first time on my channel, we're welcoming Bruce Beiser, who is the author of so many different Beatle books. The Beatles on Capitol Records, The Beatles on VJ, The Beatles Swan Song, that's the history on the Swan label, the solo records on Apple. He's also put out books that uh, really have been sort of timed with the archival box sets that have come out from Sgt. Pepper to uh, the White Album to Abbey Road and Let It Be. And now he's got a brand new one that's out. It's Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. So welcome to the show, Bruce Beiser. Glad to be here with you guys. Always a lot of fun. And also someone who's no stranger to this channel and all my programs. You know him for his many years writing for Beatle Fan Magazine, also the author of the book Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. And uh, he was also my co-host on the podcast of Things We Said Today for several years. Welcome back, Al Sussman. Hi, uh, Ken, and hi, Bruce. Hi, How are Al? you? Uh, in, in case, uh, in case people are wondering, well, what's what's this old dinosaur doing there? Uh, I'm part of the uh, sort of the support team uh, for uh, for Bruce's uh, uh, Beatles album series books. Right, he's written a piece, uh, uh, pretty much about the the our world broadcast he gets into, and this book I should explain is really about everything that followed the Sgt. Pepper album mm -hmm. from the Our World broadcast to the Magical Mystery Tour film and album, and also the Lady Madonna single, and then uh, Yellow Submarine, the movie and the album, kind of bypassing the White Album because he already covered that on another book. So that's pretty much what this book is all about. And so I thought I'd talk about Actually, before Sgt. Pepper, we know that the Beatles recorded several songs uh, before Sgt. Pepper was released in April and May of 67 that wound up on the Yellow Submarine soundtrack. And only a Northern song we know was originally meant for Sgt. Pepper. George Martin didn't like it. So George wrote Within You Without You, which George Martin accepted. But then also in that, that same time frame, they recorded all together now and it's all too much, as well as they also recorded Magical Mystery Tour and Baby You're a Rich Man. But my first question that I wanna to pose to both you guys is, and I actually asked this to Dr. Bob and Laura Cortner, who uh, I've interviewed before on the Things We Said Today podcast, and will do so on my channel next week, hopefully. Um, if they knew when they recorded It's All Too Much and All Together Now, that it was going to be in the film? Or were they just songs that they happened to be writing at the time? Obviously you think All Together Now is so perfect for the, for the film and for the sing-along at the end. Do you guys have any idea as to whether or not the Beatles were aware that it would end up in the Yellow Submarine soundtrack? I, I mean, my understanding is that they understood that these were going to be for a friggin' cartoon. And so therefore it did not have to be their best work. Altogether now is a simple song. If this was going to be for a serious Beatles project at that time, do you really think they would have quickly recorded two songs by George? I mean, it was for a friggin' cartoon. Let's let George do a song or two. So I really think that was their attitude on it. Um, Baby, you're a rich man was, you know, turned out to be pretty good. But once again, you know, I, I think they knew th that these were going to be for that for that particular project. Uh, they also started working on, you know, my name, look up the number during that time period. Mm. But that was never intended for the cartoon, although Rolling Stone magazine in April of 68 had an article on Yellow Submarine enlisted, you know, the name, look up the number close to the right title as being something for the cartoon. So, um, you know, I think they definitely knew 
that these would be for a friggin' cartoon that was going to be similar to those stupid cartoons that Brian Epstein wouldn't allow to be shown in the UK. Mm. Now, also, um, the song Across the Universe. I know that it's mentioned in your book that it, it was always proposed for that World Wildlife Charity album. But then at the same time, you always hear about that proposed EP for Yellow Submarine, where it was one of five songs that was considered. So how do you, you know, reconcile what, what was the, the mindset for that song? Was it always meant to be for that charity album or was it really considered for Yellow Submarine? Neither. Uh, that was going to be an A side of the single. I mean, John, Paul had Lady Madonna and John had Across the Universe and they were going to be competing for the A side. And when you read Beatles' book, Beatles' book comes out and says, everybody loved the song, thought it should be the single. However, it's not going to be. John, for reasons I do not understand, didn't think that it was, he thought great lyric, lousy recording. I think part of it was he, John didn't like Paul's idea to just have these two strange girls come in and sing backing vocals. And I think that prejudiced him against the song because it was a great song. And I think the, the women who tragically are no longer with us uh, uh, did a great job on it. And uh, it was a beautiful recording. So basically what happens is that they're doing some overdubs on Across the Universe. Um, you know, they recorded on the 4th, I think on the 8th of February, they're doing overdubs. And Spike Milligan happens to be visiting George Martin at Abbey Road, drops in, and there are the boys in the playback booth. There's a picture in the Beatles book of Spike Milligan sitting there with Jeff Emmerich, Paul, George Martin, and the Beatles. And uh, basically, you know, John's like, well, we're not going to use it for a single. So I can imagine the way it went down was Spike Milligan just threw out a Hail Mary out there and said, well, I'm putting together this album for the World Wildlife Fund. Can I have it? And John being John didn't think about the consequences of what he was about to do and said, yeah, you can have it. And I suspect that's why at that session, they added the sound effects of the birds to it because across the universe, there's no reason why you would have bird effects. And I know for years, we thought those bird effects were added at the last minute for the album. Well, they were added to the stereo at the last minute, but the only master they made back in February was the mono master that had those bird sound effects. So from the very beginning, um, you know, once John said, it's not going to be on the new single, um, it was going to be for that charity album. And I believe that's why the, the sound, you know, the bird sound effects were added at that time. Uh, Al, you agree with that or? Absolutely. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Do you, do you know anything to back it up that John wasn't crazy about the two girls singing on the song? I, you know, I know that he you know, said, you know, I think what he was talking about in some interview I read is, you know, Paul went out and had these girls sing back in vocals. So, I do believe I read that somewhere, although I cannot remember mm -hmm. exactly where. Somewhere way in the back of my mind, I think John did, you know, complain about that. And I think John at that time, uh, and you see it in Let It Be, uh, where John talks, or now get back, let me get the correct title. Yeah. Where John says, you know, that, uh, you know, you're giving me ideas like I'm supposed to take them, but I'd rather you give me a bunch of ideas and I'll, you know, I'll pick the one I like. So I think at that time, you know, John went along with it, but probably didn't like the idea of having, uh, you know, two Apple scruffs singing backing vocals on his song. Well, they could have remixed it and just taken them out. Not really. Well, they did. <laughs> but I mean, well, they, it was more problematic than that because um, you had the also the acoustic guitar track on some other overdubs and punch ins. So getting yeah. rid of their vocals wasn't easy. Spectre found a way to do it, but it was not easy. Very interesting. Do you know, because the Beatles only contributed four new songs for Yellow Submarine, was that their intention all along? They just didn't take it that seriously? We'll only give them a few songs? Contract. Contract recorded uh, required four songs and I think a dozen other songs. And so they did their four songs right away to get the project out the way. And Baby, You're a Rich Man was intended for the film. So when Baby, You're a Rich when All You Need Is Love was recorded, and they were rushing out the single. They needed a B-side, so they grabbed Baby or Rich Man. They could have grabbed any of those songs, 
but they picked Baby or Rich Man. So they only had three. And when the Beatles were getting ready to head to India, I suppose it might have been pointed out to them. And the crazy thing about it was the Beatles actually were at Abbey Road, but not to record a new song, but to just mime Lady Madonna for the cameras mm. for a promotional video. And they got the idea. John's like, well, I got Hey Bulldog ready to go. So they recorded Hey Bulldog and the cameras rolled. So when you look at the Lady Madonna uh, promotional video, at no time are they singing Lady Madonna, see how they run or anything. And there are no shots of Paul on piano because John would have been on piano for Hey Bulldog. So uh, that's always a very curious thing. And then later on, I think, I think, I think that was while Neil Aspinall was alive, they put together a promo video for Hey Bulldog actually using the, you know, them singing Hey Bulldog. So, sure. you know, very convoluted history, but very cool history. Mm. So then how do, how did we get to uh, the, the, now you, you mentioned the 12 songs that they were, that, obviously they wanted to use for the you know for the actual animated uh feature uh how then did we get just uh the lp with just the the, the four new songs plus yellow submarine all you need is love and then on side two the george martin score rather than the other 12 songs yeah, like the Yellow Submarine song track later on. It's actually, Capitol Records was approaching the Yellow Submarine issue before the Beatles or Parlophone, you know, and George Martin thought about it. In Capitol's concept, you know, because they had done film soundtracks that had Beatles songs and uh, the soundtracks mixed together, for instance, the Help album. Right. And um, Capitol had done Magical Mystery Tour, where you had the film sides on one side and then the other singles. So... In this case, Capital said, well, you know, we're going to go ahead and put the Yellow Submarine songs on one side and George Martin music on the other. There are only four of them. The film's called Yellow Submarine. That's a no-brainer. And what other song gives the message of the cartoon better than any other? All you need is love. So I suspect that's how it went down. Do I know for sure? No, I never, anyone, never interviewed anyone that told me that, but I do know. I was coming across articles in the British press that were saying, well, you know, EMI is going to do like Capital and issue an album with, you know, the Beatles songs on side one and George Martin's score on side two. So Capital came up. It was a it was a capital idea, shall we say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and why did they scrap the idea uh, in the UK anyway for the for the EP? Well, I, the the whole point of the EP was the Beatles felt people were buying a full album and they were only getting four new Beatles songs. So we weren't giving them good value for their money. So they got the idea to do an EP that would have those four songs and across the universe to give the people good value for their money. The problem with that was that by the time all this was ready to go, the Beatles realized the album had sold extremely well. So now that would be making their fans buy an EP for one new Beatles song, and that would not be giving them good value for their money. So I suspect that's why it got scrapped. Just mm. a theory. Okay. Because still the EPs were doing well in the UK, right? Um, well, Magical Mystery Tour mm. did well, but by the time Magical Mystery Tour came out, Record Retailer no longer had an EP chart. Mm. That's how poor EPs were doing by that time. Magical Mystery Tour was not a normal EP by any means. It outperformed everybody's expectations. Perhaps because it was priced at under a pound. Right. Okay. Let's talk about the Our World broadcast, which was the first of its kind. I know, Al, you wrote an article uh, in the book about this. And, and tell me if, you know, either one of you guys got to witness it when it was first broadcast. No, that's the uh, that's the interesting thing. Uh, 1967, obviously, this is long before social media. Hmm. Uh, it's long before the internet, um, and this was at a time also before most most of the rock press uh, existed. Rolling Stone was still 
about six months away from its first issue, Crawdaddy was around. But uh, to find out information, and this is really more for America than in England, where they obviously had the, uh, you know, the music, the music weeklies. Mm. But here, um, to find out news about the Beatles or most other, uh, most other bands, uh, you either had to go through the teen magazines <laughs> or just, uh, you know, radio stations or, you know, whatever. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't much. So I would say the vast majority of Beatles fans didn't know anything about our world until after it, the, the, the telecast had already happened and, uh, and word came out that they had performed this new song, All You Need Is Love. I know I didn't, I didn't know about it until the next day myself. Yeah, and what happened with me, um, my parents got TV Guide Hmm. And TV Guide had a full page spread on our world, but it didn't have in big caps anywhere. The Beatles will be recording a song right. live. And I missed it. Plain as that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, Jude, our, our good friend Jude, has done those wonderful John Lennon books in the fan recollection that she wrote. And all my books have a fan recollection section. And in Jude's fan recollection, she said all of her friends, because she was a Beatles fan, knew she was aware of it. But she wasn't, and she was out water skiing that day and didn't find out about it until <laughs> afterwards. And everyone was like, well, we knew you knew about it. She's like, what? <laughs> so even the radio stations, the top 40 radio stations, they weren't aware of this going on? They, they weren't Maybe. making at least, you know, I never heard WTIX in New Orleans say anything about it. And, no, no, Al can talk about New York. I think New York actually put the song on the air, taped it and had it on the air before the single. Right. Can you confirm that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Murray the K had it on the on the air uh the next night on Monday night. You know, it was another one of these tinny third generation quality uh recordings, but still it was the song. You know, but the uh uh you know the the record itself uh didn't become reality for what about two and a half weeks. Right. Yeah, they must have just put a, hel a handheld microphone to the TV with a tape recorder of some kind. Most likely, maybe, yeah. Maybe a reel-to-reel -reel or something. And then that's what it, I did when the Beatles on the were on the Ed Sullivan show doing uh, Two of Us and Let It Be on the Ed Sullivan Salutes the Beatles show or whatever. Right. So that's how you did it back then. Yeah. Yeah. My future wife, Joanne, at the time, she would have been uh, thir um, 15. And she knew about this and she was visiting, about to visit her uncle in Connecticut, in Newington. And her father was driving Joanne to the house. And all of a sudden there was a tornado on the way and they had to stop the car. And by the time they got to, to uh, their uncle's house, her uncle's house, the Beatles had already performed. Oh. So, her uncle knew all about it, had a TV with a, a coin box, I guess they had back then. It's kind of like an early version of pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she's always telling me about that, how she missed out on that opportunity. That's amazing. Oh. Yeah. So um, talk about All You Need Is Love. One of the things I like uh, about your books, not just this one, is that you give reviews as they appeared in both the U.S. and in the U.K., um, the British reaction to All You Need Is Love um, and Baby You're a Rich Man were pretty positive, but there are actually some that liked Baby You're a Rich Man more. Yeah, I think the, the complaint for some people about All You Need Is Love was that the song was simplistic, but other people raved about that. I think Penny Valentine and Disc pointed out that, you know, it was, you know, the Beatles could take a simple thing and, and make something really special out of it. And, um, you know, and then some of the reviews said, well, the nice thing about this song was you know, she shows the Beatles aren't going too far out there. And so, you know, it, but most people like, but there was one guy who wrote and say he liked it, but he was surprised how many people thought it was too simple. You know, to me, it was a great song. I think Penny Valentine said, and the world will sing along. And she was, of course, right. The, the point of the song and why it had to have simple lyrics was, it was being broadcast to dozens of foreign countries where many people didn't speak English. 
And right. so it had to right. be a simple song. And that's why it was. And, you know, and to me, it was the perfect, I think Brian summed it up. He said, you know, he explained that it has to be simple because of that. He said, and it's, it's a message, a wonderful message. When you say all you need is love, you've said it all. So it got yeah. great reviews. And, and uh, I think it might've been Penny Valentine and Disc, Love Baby, A Rich Man, and said she could, you know, see, and she wanted to give the idea that the rhythms and everything in it, and today it might not be politically correct, but she said, I think something to the effect of you could see the brown arm swaying to the song or something to that effect. And, uh, but, you know, the whole point was, you know, it was a great double side single, Baby or Rich Man had mm. wonderful instrumentation to it. And for a throwaway song for a friggin' cartoon, it's, it holds up really well. Huh. Yeah. Also, um, it's interesting that as early as July and August that year, there were reports in the British press that the Beatles were already planning a one hour TV special. Yeah. I mean, look, let's put the post pepper period PPP in perspective. That's a fourth P. All hmm. right. Uh, the Beatles finished Sergeant Pepper and Paul goes to visit Jane Asher in the United States and the Beatles always take a little bit of a break. So think of it. You've won the Super Bowl. You go to Disneyland and then you come back and rather than taking several months off, you begin two a days immediately. Nobody does that. So what do the Beatles do? They get back and they're in the studio constantly recording songs for that. Now, Paul got the idea for Magical Mystery Tour on this little vacation. And Beatles book had some excerpts from Mal Evans's diary. And Mal talks about it, you know, well, you know, and he, his whole thing about it, you know, says, uh, you know, Paul and I, you know, Paul met Jane, you know, I drove him up to the Rockies, a real magical mystery trip. And then, you know, comes up, Paul's got this idea for a film. Uh, he's got a song for it, roll up for the magical mystery trip, you know, things like that. So Mal is kind of understands what's going on and getting into it. You know, this may be the next single. And so that, you know, you know, like Al was saying, there was nothing for us to read in the U S but in the UK, oh. you had four music weeklies plus the Beatles book came out once a month. And between that, you know, it's amazing what they knew. I mean, they knew uh, around the same time frame of all, a little bit before all you need is love. The Beatles were going to do that third film called shades of a personality, which did not occur, right. but they also had Paul talking about doing this TV spectacular and things. And then also, you know, shortly around the same time, the Beatles were going to do this cartoon tentatively titled Yellow Submarine. So the people in the UK were all aware of these fabulous post pepper projects that were in the works. We in the States had no freaking idea. Mm. They had a lot of irons in the fire there. Um, yeah. But it also says in your book that um, the film for Magical Mystery Tour was a replacement for a proposed Sgt. Pepper TV special. Yeah, the original idea was to do a Sgt. Pepper TV special and that A Day in the Life was actually where they were filming the orchestra and all and actually did mm. a video for A Day in the Life. And, you know, that's basically, I guess, what the show would be like. But then, you know, Paul got this idea of, you know, well, let's do this uh, Christmas spectacular. And so the Pepper thing was put on hold and was never done. And later the press did announce that the, that, this would be a replacement for it. So that is correct. At one point in time, it was going to be a Sergeant Pepper project. Sort of like thinking about the uh, Get Back thing. Yep. Originally, yeah. Get Back was going to be the Beatles performing songs from the White Album. And then Paul got the idea, why don't we you know, rehearse some new songs and do some new songs for it? So I think Paul likes to set the bar higher than what he originally envisions. And Fortunately, in those mm -hmm. days, he seemed to, to be able to reach that bar. Although we can, we'll talk about the magical mystery tour of the film later, I'm sure. But Paul was always very ambitious with projects. History repeats, doesn't it? <laughs> when it comes yes, it to does. the Beatles. It certainly does. Yeah. Yeah. So um, talk about the death of Brian Epstein, <laughs> which is a show to itself. Um, and what kind of an impact you think that had on the group? I know that there are a well, lot of people who would say that they lack direction once he died. And yet at the same time, Brian did approve Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah, he, he did. I'm going to speak a little bit and then turn it over to Al on it. But, you know, the, the main observations I have is that um, quotes from John, they were with the Mahadishi 
and they were wanted to learn more about transcendental meditation. And John said, well, you know, Brian Steph changes things. And, you know, all the more reason we need to go meditate with the Mahadishi. Um, the most memorable quote to me about it was one that Alistair Taylor, who was the Beatles fix it mm -hmm. man, told me, and he said he was sitting next to John. I think it was actually at Brian's house after his death. And he said, John turned to me and he said, we fucking had it. And I'll turn it over to Al. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the, the thought that keeps going through my, uh, my brain is that uh, considering how Magical Mystery Tour came out and getting a little bit, a little bit ahead of the story, uh, one wonders, it's an imponderable, is whether, whether Brian would have allowed that totally improvised nature of the film to you know to become what it was mm -hmm. you know it, it you know it really or would he as a trained um would be actor uh if if he would have kind of mandated that they do something a little bit that was somewhat more disciplined but that's I mean, one that's, of the great, great ponderables question. yeah it's a it's a great question now i think Brian's instincts would probably have told them, guys, you know, this is, this has some issues. But by that time, John and Paul were running the show, just like by 66 with the butcher cover. That's another yeah. show we'll have to do. But on the yeah. butcher cover, clearly, you know, John says, I want this. And Brian's horrified by it. Yet Brian has to try to sell it to capital. And of course, when it blows up, Brian has to take the blame because he can't let his boys be guilty of bad judgment but you know it's it's a wonderful question now and we can always you know wonder about it and when we talk about the reaction uh you know there's some things that i learned about it later so i really can't wait till we get to the film but i know we probably have a, a few other things to talk about like the music and the ep and the lp but we definitely need to spend some time on the film itself but the other thing and once again taking it a step forward to the get back thing you have paul talking about the band needing directions and you know and you know daddy's not here anymore when he says that he means brian's not here anymore mm -hmm. yeah. and that causes paul to assume that role by default you know in their private conversation paul says you know john john you're always the boss and john says not always and i think what john's meaning is you know now that brian's dead and i'm spending time with yoko you're the boss and of course, the other Beatles did come to resent that to a certain extent. Yeah, and even if you follow what Paul was saying around the time of the Get Back, Let It Be sessions, he didn't like being the leader. He didn't want to have to keep driving the band. And I think once you, when you watch the Get Back documentary, once things change and they start recording and rehearsing at Apple, John takes char charge. And I think that, that Paul is relieved by it pretty much yeah. so yeah yeah in fact, so, i mean can, obviously can... we're gonna we're gonna spend a, a bit of time on um, on let it be and get back and all that other fun stuff but uh you know like i said for those in the british press you also for october and november you know you pick up these music weeklies and you could actually read oh the beatles were you know in cornwall filming this and there's some scene involved uh, bathing beauties in a swimming pool which actually mm. didn't make the final cut Right. But we got to see many years later, uh, you know, and things like that. So not only were you reading uh, about the project, you actually were reading about the actual filming of the project. Uh, so, I mean, it was just really special. And the Beatles had high hopes for this. Uh, Beatles book talked about the fact, I think it was, um, you know, Neil and Mao were talking about the fact that this was going to be a new phase for the Beatles. And this was going to be how they did it. You know, they no longer... Were going to have other people giving them scripts they didn't like they were going to do their own scripts they were going to write it they were going to direct it they were going to cast it and all this other stuff and they really thought that was their future hmm. and as we'll get to later on in this show it didn't quite work out that way one of my favorite quotes early on from paul and i think he gave it to uh in the beatles book to uh johnny dean when he's talking about this show they're doing and he says well you know um that all the stuff on TV is is rubbish. So we're going to do our own show and it shouldn't be that hard to do. And of course, one of the words thrown at the Beatles for their show is rubbish. Rubbish. 
<laughs> so exactly a lot of fun stuff in the in, in in the book there's you know people think how could you do a you know book on magical mystery tour and yellow submarine is it going to really be anything yeah there's a lot of cool stuff in the book definitely some cool stuff thanks to fan recollections and you know articles by al and frank daniels and things like that so right um you know it was actually you know some people have already told me that this is their favorite book maybe because it's the most recent but I've had a bunch of people email me and say that this is now their favorite book out of the series. Yeah, there's a couple of articles in there that I enjoyed a lot. Uh, the Frank Daniels one about the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and whether or not the Stones were always copying the Beatles. And I don't know if you guys want to get into that. But there's another one where you're sure. talking about all the um, the proposed movies that they could have made, yeah. Yeah. which I found yeah. to be interesting that I think many of us have heard about. You want to just briefly talk about that there was a, one called the talent for loving that was going to be a, a country and western film yeah and the, the weird thing we'll, we'll kind of flip back and forth i'll take a talent yeah. for loving uh, the fun thing about it was it was going to be this this western style movie and ringo were thought gee that's really cool and they were talking about the beatles were going to have to write these country western songs for the film so that was an idea though that they weren't too happy with the script which was the problem with that one. And I'll turn it over to Al now for some other rejected ideas. Up against it. Yeah, they would have been up right? against it had they done that one, Al. Can you explain why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can do that uh, more tastefully than I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the problem with up against it was it was, you know, getting into some counterculture ideas and um, some of the characters in the film uh, were gay and as hmm. Paul said you know it's not that we're against them gay people it's just the Beatles were not you know gay so hmm. you know it, it didn't make any sense for them to do it but that film had a lot of other problems too they were you know starting revolutions and all kind of other it, it would not have been good for the image it would have made the butcher cover look tame had they done that film would have been a radical departure from a hard day's night and help that's for sure Oh, yeah. And, and, and of course, I mean, the most tantalizing one mm. is, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings. Yes. Right. And the Beatles are meeting with the Maharishi and Dennis O'Dell brings, um, you know, the trilogy and the Lord of the Rings and the whole thing. And the Beatles are reading it in the and absolutely loving it and envisioning who could I get to play in, you know, and all. And it would be fun to do the music for this type of thing because they would have had to write original songs for it. Mm. And um, the problem was couple of them you know could you really make a movie out of it they wanted kubrick to direct it in kubrick even kubrick who was doing 2001 said you can't make a movie out of this and i thought that which was fascinating and <laughs> with, the, with the technology at the time kubrick was probably right and thank god the beatles didn't do it but tolkien is the one who really killed the project because they could have gotten other directors but tolkien basically said no i don't want a pop group doing my, you know my middle earth series and that was that Hmm. And ironically, the uh, the Peter Jackson, the first Peter Jackson uh, Lord of the Rings uh, film debuted in London 20 years ago tomorrow. There you go. And yeah. Peter Jackson's doing quite well right now with uh, his latest project. Uh, you so. could say. <laughs> and and, and I, I think uh, one thing I've read from Peter Jackson was he was saying, you know, that it was kind of a mixed feeling. He was glad he did it all, but he said, I, I really wonder what the music would have been like had the Beatles done the music. And I guess yeah. George Martin, I guess, would have done the instrumental score for it. I uh, imagine you know, which, so, yeah. Which probably would have been fantastic. Sure. Yeah. You know. I don't think Ken Thorne would have gotten that one, but that's a whole nother uh, story. No. Yeah. We can, when we talk about help, we'll talk about that. You right. also mentioned that Richard Lester had um, pitched an idea of them doing the Three Musketeers. Yeah, and I think they would have accepted that had they known Raquel Welch was going to be in it. I'm just just speculating. <laughs> now they, they what the idea was was they just didn't want to do that type of film. Period. They didn't really, quite frankly, they didn't know what they wanted to do. The weirdest thing, and I think I talked about that in the um, the Beatles finally let it be book, where George is talking about that the Beatles now have agreed on a film they're going to do and they all love the script and it's going to be great. And I have no idea what he's talking about. Huh. And I've asked a bunch of people and no one seems to know. So the next time you're having drinks with Paul, 
ask Paul if he knows what George was talking about uh, when he said in 1969, the Beatles had agreed on a script for their next movie. Well, if I get to talk to Peter Jackson again, I'll bring that up. I'll There's make a an note of that. Because, because Paul certainly won't know, given, given how much of what's in Get Back he doesn't remember <laughs> at That's... all. You know, such as being involved with the with writing, give me some truth with John. Mm. You know, it's, given it's, how much he doesn't remember, he's not a really good source. It's no. it's really kind of shocking. I know, you know, it happens with age, but um, yes, when we when when we interviewed Peter, I know Peter said that he asked Paul, "What was your idea from the very beginning of Get Back?" You know, and Paul said he really doesn't remember. Of those well, sessions. fortunately, you know, we know what is the idea. You mean for the song yeah. or the film? No, for the for that whole month, the yeah, whole project I mean, of what was it going to be. But yeah, we yeah. know. I mean, read my book, The Beatles Finally Let It Be. I pulled it out of the British press. We know what his idea was. <laughs> he may I'm not just, remember it, but he certainly told the British press about it. It's just shocking to me that something like that. Well, probably when he watches this whole thing. He'd remember, I would hope. It should bring back the memories. Yeah, you would think so. Yeah. So let's go back again to Magical Mystery Tour. And um, it certainly had a mixed reaction in the British press. I know you said- I think, had a, I think you know, if we're talking about the film- The film. And we also need to talk about the music, but we can talk we about will. the film, even though the music came out first. Hmm. So bear in mind, the Beatles put out this EP and it's getting rave reviews. And then the Beatles show Magical Mystery Tour to the music press. And they see a nice pristine color print of it and they love it. Um, one of the people writing for the British press, music press said the Beatles must make another Magical Mystery Tour. I think it was Nori Paramore. And what he basically is saying is that, you know, it's brilliant. It's, it's got all these wonderful things about it. Ringo's great. The song, song sequences are clever. And the, the music press loved it. So the film itself gets broadcast on the BBC on Boxing Day, which doesn't mean people were boxing that day. Uh, it's you know, fighting. It's the day after Christmas. Why is it called Boxing Day? It's the day you box up the presents you don't like so you can take them back to the store. And that's why it's called that. It's a day. That's a holiday in the UK. Yeah. The family is off. They're sitting around drinking and eating and watching the telly. And they're expecting Christmas fair type entertainment. So what do they get on BBC One? They get something that has nothing to do with, you know, Christmas holiday songs or cheer. It's not easy to follow. It's in black and white and all these other things. And the British press is brutal. Rubbish was one of the nicest things said about it. You know, the Beatles are pretentious. They're ignoring their audience. I mean, just you name it, pill, garbage. Mm. And the BBC got tons of complaints. So it wasn't just the film critics that were trashing it. People watching it on the BBC trashed it. So a few days later, the film gets shown in color. And some reviewer says, oh, it's great in color and all. You know, and so everyone says the BBC screwed the Beatles. Okay, that's the story. But fortunately, I have fan recollections in my book. And Gary Marsh, who wrote a very thoughtful fan recollection and lived through the Beatles era, you know, as it was happening in real time and watched Magical Mystery Tour with his father and his grandmother. And he loved it. And so did his dad and his grandma. They saw it in black and white. And I said, well, what was it like when you saw it a few days later in color? And he says, color? I saw it in BBC Two, broadcasting color in black and white. He said, Bruce, the only people that had color TVs in the UK at that time were people like the Beatles and the Queen. And it wouldn't have mattered if BBC had broadcasted in color on Boxing Day because hardly anyone had a color TV to begin with. So it was great to get that perspective from someone who lived it all rather than, you know, read, oh, they, you know, BBC was so terrible. They didn't show it in color. Wouldn't have mattered. It was going to be shown in black and white to 95% or more of the population of the UK because of the very limited access to color televisions at that time. Was it better in color? Of course. Yeah. Not the BBC's fault. 
that's a shame that most people didn't have color at that time. It could have changed the perception of the film. It could have, but you know, it, it also, like some of the people they interviewed at the time after it came out, and it might have... Uh, might have been Pete Townsend, might have been someone else, but it's the basic idea. Look, this is Boxing Day when people are sitting around drunk and eating. It's just not the right time to show that film. But the Beatles were the ones who wanted it to be, you know, a Christmas TV spectacular. So once again, don't blame the BBC for scheduling it then. That was what the Beatles wanted. Interesting. Now, as for the music, go ahead. And well, uh, just to follow up, and it was the the unfortunate reaction in the British press that scared off. Uh, I believe it was NBC. NBC, yeah. That right. That was that had already basically put Magical Mystery Tour on on its schedule for some time. I think in the spring of '68 or something. Yeah, and it was going to be at, at a million dollars, and yeah. they didn't want to put a you know a ratings turkey on for a million dollars. And of course the irony was if NBC had shown it, a very large segment of the US population would have seen it in color. Exactly. That's true. <sighs> yeah. I mean all the networks were competing for it, right? They all wanted yeah, they it were. originally. NBC won the bidding and then NBC backed out because and, and none of the other networks ABC didn't want to touch it. And you so also right cover out. Canada. Canada passed on Running, yeah, kind of running, to pass uh, on it as well. And, you know, it was a shame because, uh, you know, I think it would have done better in those markets because it wouldn't have been on Boxing Day in black and white. Hmm. And, and Bruce uncovered uh, in his research for the book uh, when, uh, because obviously uh, there, there were no mass showings of of magical mystery tour other than in like some midnight showings in movie theaters during the early 70s but Bruce yeah. uncovered what i think is probably the first showing yeah, I, I, in, I think in the so. US. And, yeah and that yeah. was and you know and i'm going to tell you all who are watching this because look ken is paying me big bucks to do this show and uh so I'm for gonna that go reason broke. I'm gonna He's not the, paying me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let the cat out of the bag, but do buy the book anyway, because there are a lot of other great things in it. But what happens is, well, I think it was May 10th. Uh, someone can look it up in the book real quick. But anyway, um, played at a movie theater in L.A., uh, and it was a midnight movie, and it was a fundraiser for a group of striking disc jockeys. And it was, a, and I saw the ad in the paper in the LA Times. It was a three dollar donation, was what admission was at admission three dollar donation. And the deal was, and you might say, well, how did these striking FM disc jockeys get it? Derek Taylor, who is press agent for NEMS, and the Beatles, of course, knew him very well. They sent him a copy of the film, and Derek Taylor had it, and he made a deal with the disc jockeys. You can show this and raise some money. Derek wanted to ingratiate himself with FM disc jockeys because he was managing groups like the Birds and wanted to make sure that FM disc jockeys would be playing their music and would be grateful to him for helping them out when they were on strike. Mm-hmm. So that's you know, how the, polit- the politics behind it. But Derek Taylor, who had read the brutal reviews in the British press, made a deal and basically said it could not be reviewed. And the LA Times reported on the film but could not review it. However, they did say it got a tremendous reaction from the audience. So the film plays on a Friday night with very little publicity and about 500 people show up without the internet. The next night on Saturday night, 700 people show up, which is a theater maximum at the Los Feliz Theater and um, does well. Now, the donations went even further Uh, on the campus of UCLA. And I did not know about this one from the LA Times. Once again, fan recollections, an important section in the book. A guy writes into me and says, Bruce, I saw a magical mystery tour, probably one of the first showings in LA. LA, hell, the country, had to tell the guy. Hmm. And uh, and there was a flyer for the film and I have it. Would you like to see it? Yes. And he (laughs) sends it to me. And this is this poster from like, you know, I think, what was it, the 14th or 15th of May, UCLA campus, and admission was $1.50 because students couldn't afford $3 to see a movie. And there were two showings of it 
on the campus of UCLA. And then the following weekend, there were two more showings at theaters in Pasadena at midnight, and I think a Sunday morning matinee as well. And that's kind of where the trail ends. So it raised money for disc jockeys, and it did get shown a bit in LA, and the LA Free Press apparently was not going to honor an embargo on it. And the review of that from the LA Free Press, the guy used every imaginable superlative you could have. And contradictory things, you know, it's a message film, it's a thriller, it's this, it's that, it's that. And he concluded by saying it is the Beatles' best film. So the uh, so the LA Press gave it great reviews, and Paul probably never even knew that. And if Paul reads my book, he'll learn that. Wow. You know, I have the uh, radio station here you were referring to, um, where the disc jockeys went on strike. That's KPPC-FM. Yep station that became KROQ. And actually the, the Los Feliz Theater, May 10th was before the UCLA. Yes, that's okay. absolutely correct. So, so really the first showing was at the Los Feliz Theater. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, you know, unless somebody finds something earlier, but this is several months earlier because before people would claim it was shown at the Fillmore and nobody could confirm it, but people claimed it was shown at the Fillmore, and that was a couple of months later. So as far as I can tell, this is the first I discussed it with Mark Lewis, and he was excited to find out about that and said, Bruce, I don't, I don't know of anything earlier. You know, maybe there was a private screening where, you know, Matt Weiss and Paul looked at it or something, but as far as an actual charge admission for people to come see it, that's the absolute earliest I was able to find. Yeah, I can't remember the first time I saw the film. It probably was at Beetlefest. <laughs> right, because that was that it became it became a tradition right from the the right from the get go that uh, uh, it was the the last thing, the last <coughs> event of the weekend at the early fests. Mm. When this is back when the when the when the films were still shown in the ballroom. Right. Yeah. And, um, is, uh, is one of the fan recollections in the book is Mark Lapidos talking about watching it with Mal Evans. So, yeah. you know, yeah. once again, you know, people say, well, is there anything new in the book? Yeah, there's a lot of new stuff in there because we get some wonderful fan recollections from people of stories that we wouldn't know. I mean, you know, imagine when I did this book, I had no idea that I would have a flyer from one of the first Magical Mystery Tour screenings months ahead of when I thought it would be and be able to reproduce that in the book. You know, who, who would have expected that? Yeah. And just uh, recently, I interviewed Mark Lapidos, who talked about that, talking to Mel Evans and saying, I remember when I shot Fool on the Hill with Paul and, you know, all this yeah. other stuff. Incredible. Yeah, he told the story of Paul didn't have a passport. Somehow right. they let him in yeah. anyway. <laughs> hey, he's one of the most powerful people in the world at that moment. You let him in. Yeah, certainly nope. one of the most well-known. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, the um, the music of Magical Mystery Tour, I mean, to me, I love all the songs, but following something as monumental as Sgt. Pepper, you do have some criticism here in the book from various people, especially uh, <laughs> wow. Richard Goldstein um, in the New York Times, who said the Beatles' popularity is waning among the very young due to the inevitable result of artistic complexity. I see. <laughs> Don't why, understand. Why, why don't you flip a page or two and, and read what Rex Reed had to say in stereo oh, high I have it. No. I have it right here. I have it right here. He wrote, um, if you buy this platter of phony, pretentious, overcooked tripe, then you and the Beatles deserve each other. Yeah, he used the word repulsive. <laughs> I must have missed that. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, it was just terrible. Whereas Hit Parader said that it shows the Beatles are, you know, ahead of skill, 80 skillion others, whatever skillion means. I guess they were just putting in perspective that the Beatles are so far ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. One of the other interesting reviews in the UK was actually um, one of the magazines was doing a thing on stereo becoming you know, acceptable in the UK and people buying stereo equipment. And the EP was done in mono and stereo, which was, you know, different for that day. And they were oh. saying, you know, was Pepper, we were told many years later, you have to hear it in mono. 
they were saying, hey, Magical Mystery Tier, you need to hear it in stereo. So I found that how quick the conversion from mono to stereo went. And uh, you know, the songs, of course, are brilliant. You know, you said their Magical Mystery Tour. You know, what a great way to open up an album in a, you know, in a film, pretty much. And then, you know, Fool on the Hill, a beautiful ballad that, you know, the, when the first time I heard Fool on the Hill, I said, one day Sergio Mendez and Brazil 66 are going to cover it. I'm I sure didn't say that, that. <laughs> but um, but I think Rex Reed in his review said that 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 would be a song that if somebody else did, he might be able to tolerate. Uh, and then flying, don't underestimate flying, very oh, cool instrumental. All. And then you know, Blue Jay Way, very mystical sound. Your mother should know. Hey, look, it's a corny type of Paul song, but hey, it's a good corny it type works. of Paul song. Yeah. And, and what can you say about I Am the Walrus? I mean, what a brilliant song. And, you know, and John just at the mixing board gets this crazy idea to turn on the BBC and mixes in bits of King Lear. And it sounds like it belongs there. Mm. And, and my one of my favorite little stories about that is many, many years later, I'm in London for a little Beatles thing I'm doing. And I noticed that the Globe Theater has a production of King Lear. So I go to see King Lear in the Globe Theater. How cool is that? And when they get to the deaf scene, I know all the words. I've mm. heard it hundreds of times. It's funny during the whole Paul is dead rumor thing. It was like planted in my brain that you're hearing Paul is really dead. You know? Sit you down, Paul, the rest of you. <laughs> Is he dead? Is he gone? <laughs> but they're really saying, oh, untimely death. There. Yes. But um, in my brain, I was hearing that because I think I was told that's what was said during those Paul is dead clues. You know, but, it's yeah. weird. It's weird. And, and flipping a little bit to the Frank Daniels article on the Beatles and the Stones, and we get back to it. But one of the funny things was that, you know, we had read that the Beatles did sing backing vocals on We Love You. And one of the engineers involved actually said, no, they also sang Dandelion. So that was kind of interesting. And, um, you know, and then the question was, did they sing, why don't we sing this song all together? Sounds like they could have, but I don't think they couldn't certainly establish mm. that rumor. But right. the thing is, there's this Carnival Barker right before She's a Rainbow, which is probably the most Beatles sounding thing on the album. Mm. And I swear to you, listen to that one day. And when you're listening to it, Right before the thing ends, think in your mind, he's saying, are you already the Beatles song? And you will hear him say the Beatles song, even though that is not what he is saying. <laughs> and I tried it with Frank Daniels and Frank said, no, Bruce, this is what he actually says. And I said, Frank, in your mind, think he's saying the Beatles song. Let me know what you think. Yeah, it sounds like he's saying the Beatles song, but he's really not. Yeah, I know, Frank. <laughs> it just sounds, that's funny how the mind plays tricks on you. The power of suggestion. Absolutely. But but it is true that that John and Paul are on Dandelion. Uh, yeah, they are good backing vocals, according to the okay. engineer from, uh, you know, uh, region that was there. Yeah, which Olympic, makes sense. Olympic, Olympic Studios. Yeah, yeah, which makes sense because uh, they would be on then both sides of uh, that single. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And it's if you listen to it, it kind of sounds like there's some notes hit there that. Yeah, you know, the kind of things that Bill Wyman or Keith Richard would be hitting. I'll listen more carefully now. <laughs> yep. Okay. And and interesting, Full on the Hill, the Sergio Mendez version is among my absolute favorite of Beatle covers. Yeah. It's just a now very different there's arrangement. Something, there's something else in the book that I really had to work hard to get. Frank Daniels helped me get it by lining up with the right person. There is a picture of the Beatles at Abbey Road with Paul sitting behind the piano with a recorder and the other Beatles looking on. And that's when they were working on Fool on the Hill, obviously. And it was taken mm. by a Japanese photographer. Apparently some Japanese woman was interviewing the Beatles that day. And the photographer took a bunch of color pictures, which are not that common, of the Beatles and Abbey Road. And I was able to license that picture for the book. And uh, that was an interesting negotiation with them. Uh, very, very nice gentleman in Japan. And it was a real time lag between it because he would send me something and then I would reply to it. And then several hours later, he would get it because it was the next day and get, you know, it was kind of like that. 
Uh, but to me, that was the most I've ever paid to license a picture for in one of my books, but it was worth every penny. So that's another cool thing you get in the book is the Beatles in the studio, in color, working on Fool on the Hill. Okay. Now, the album for Magical Ministry Tour with Side 2, putting all those A-sides and B-sides, the singles, was there any objection to that at all? I mean, for the Beatles to have said, you know, they want to give as much for your money as possible, and they're putting singles that people have already bought on their uh, album. I'll give you my theory on it, and also from what I know. By the time Sgt. Pepper came out, the Beatles' contract with Capitol required that they get absolute approval of everything. So that's why, you know, you did get this rush of singles and things being different. They wanted it the same everywhere in the world. And Capitol Records was one of the worst abusers of it in their minds by then. Although, quite frankly, another show we'll have to do is Meet the Beatles and the Beatles' second album. And I'll talk about how brilliant they were. But getting back to the matter at hand, Capital needed to get permission. There was an article in Billboard magazine that I found where I think it was Boyle Gilmore went over to the UK and met with the Beatles and they agreed to it because he explained to them, EPs do not sell in the US. You will be committing, you know, record suicide here. You have to let us do it. We know our market. We want to do an LP. And, I'm, and it was a gatefold LP. It had the booklet. It had to be expensive for capital. I'm sure it added, you know, 30, 40 cents to each album. And I'm sure the Beatles told them, you know, this EP set, this wasn't in the Billboard article, but I think this was part of the negotiation. Our EP set is going to be under a pound. You cannot charge a premium for this. And bear in mind, capital charged a dollar more for help because it had a gatefold. So I guarantee you capital would have liked to have charged a dollar more than they would for Magical Mystery Tour, I would guess, and I could be wrong, but the possibility that Capital was forced to agree to keep the price the same by the Beatles for a condition to put it out. And I'm sure Capital explained to them, Americans like songs on the album. Hit singles make hit albums. Trust us, we know our market. And the Beatles said, hey, go for it. It sold 2 million copies in less than a month. Capital made the right call, obviously. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, think you're oh. having a party. For example, I, I took my Magical Mystery Tour album to a party. There is a picture in the book of me taking it, you know, right after the album came out, age, I guess, 12, with the Magical Mystery Tour in my arm, leaving my house to go to a party. Now, I took that album to the party, put it on the turntable, got up once and flipped it over. All right, let's suppose you've got that EP set and you want to listen to the same songs. You need mm. the two EP discs. How many times you got to flip them over each time? You also need the Hello Goodbye single. You need the All You Need Is Love single and the Strawberry Field single. Imagine how much work I would have had to done at that party rather than just flipping it over one time. Although okay. from a uh, from a you know kind of a music nerd fan standpoint, I. Uh, there is one one objection, and that is that uh, in, on side two, uh, now correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, but Penny Lane, Baby You're a Rich Man, and All You Need Is Love are all in reprocessed stereo, or duophonic as Capital called it in those days. Which Not was... on the mono album, Al, but I'm, I'm teasing you because mono was really, Capital did a mono album. However, right. but it, it wasn't was really being phased out then. Mark Lapidos yes. in his fan recollection talks about going to the record store to buy mono and stereo copies for his friends. And he has to buy all stereo because there are no right. mono copies. Capital had a surplus of the mono albums, which they sent down to, I think it might have been Brazil. They went down to South America. So the easiest way to get Magical Mystery Tour, Capital Pressing, and mono is from South America and not oh, the wow. U.S. Um, Yes, they used reprocessing because they were not available and Capital didn't think to ask them to make stereo mixes. The first time they appeared in stereo was a little bit later uh, when the German version of it, which yes. originally comes out with reprocess, but then the, you know, the very shortly thereafter, they get it in complete stereo. And that's mm -hmm. the first time you have all of those songs in stereo. Now, the other thing too, I will say, is that 
Parlophone and George Martin did have some limitations with the double set EP. You were going to have three songs on each EP disc, which meant the long songs had to be on one side and the shorter songs on the other. If you take the running order by Capital, I like Capital's running order better than the running order on the EP. I think it is a much better program, mm. strictly from the running order of the Magical Mystery Four songs, never mind the side two greatness. And eventually, of course, uh, the, it became a part of the Beatles core catalog. So mm. about, I guess it was about eight or nine years later, the yeah. UK, real, it was nine years later, the UK said, yeah, this is the way to do it. And so then it became available on an album in the UK. They imported copies of the album from the US and it actually did make the British album charts. And I think they said they might've imported something like 50,000 copies or something. And it was very expensive in the UK. It was not, it was much more than a UK album. But I love the Capitol, I'm in a bigger booklet. Let's do a little bit of mind games here. Let's <laughs> pretend that Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane and All You Need Is Love and Baby You're a Rich Man and Hello Goodbye had never come out in the United States. And the Capitol album came out, Magical Mystery Tour. That would be one of the Beatles' greatest albums, bar none. Agreed? All these so, songs so are due to you. In other words, there's an alternate universe right. where you buy Magical Mystery Tour and songs you've never heard before, Hello Goodbye, Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, oh, Baby yeah. Richmond, all you oh, need is okay. love. If they never came out of singles first, but they're on the album, yes. you're saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that would be a fantastic album. Oh, fabulous. Have to be one of the Beatles' greatest albums ever. Mm -hmm. Of course, while I follows, never list magical, say top. <laughs> and, and while I never list Magical Mystery Tour in one of my top five Beatle albums, it really is. You know, it's yeah. one of their best albums. Mm. Let's be honest. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's up Any there. album with Strawberry Fields Forever, Penny Lane, and All You Need Is Love, and I Am the Walrus, and A Low Goodbye. Come on. Fool on the Hill. Well, gotta I gotta be among the best. I gotta play Sabby Road, White Album, Revolver, Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. I you said, know, those gotta are, those be up are there, the, though. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, a little bit more about the film for Magical Mystery Tour. Do you think that the public's opinion has changed at all um, since it's, well, let's, let's face it, it's a lot of people look at it as the, the first Beatles mistake. <laughs> um, <laughs> Other than the butcher cover and John's Jesus remarks. Mm, okay. Uh, yes. All right. All right. The third mistake. <laughs> actually i don't really look at uh the other two as mistakes but um but anyway uh because there are some people who look at the film now as being you know a very free form kind of ahead of its time a sample of the of the counterculture um the underground if you will and um but then there'll always be those fans who have the same opinion that um, well, you know, because of the fact that it lacked a you know a real script, you know, and uh, didn't have much direction to it, there are you know as individual videos, I think it's brilliant. Sure. Um, but you know, I want to read to you because I just saw this new article, and it was in a magazine called Little White Lies, and I'm just going to read this description here which says, while contemporary audiences may have been confused by the film's amateurish production and lack of a conventional narrative, the film has become more accessible over time. Running just under an hour and anchored by a series of extravagant musical sequences, Magical Mystery Tour is essentially the blueprint for modern visual album popularized by the likes of Beyonce and Janelle Monet. Influences of 60s counterculture and cinema verite, once condemned as inexplicable, now seem ahead of their time. As a work of multimedia pop art, Magical Mystery Tour challenged the preconceptions of an entertainment, challenged the preconceptions of an entertainment establishment, which the Beatles had already outrun. And their vision was later vindicated by the emergence of MTV 
and the lavish music videos which be which become so ubiquitous. How do you feel about that quote? It's actually kind of similar to what uh, some people, some film buffs have said about uh, the monkeys movie head. Hmm. There you go. You know, um, in, in that respect. Uh, are I, we I gonna, think are though, we gonna, do I need to head off this controversy about the Beatles and the monkeys, Al? Or are we gonna... Yeah, right. <laughs> I think part of the you know conventional wisdom surrounding Magical Mystery Tour is kind of similar to uh, to what you know has gone on all these years about about Let It Be, uh, and I, and especially here in America because no. of the fact that okay, well, Magical Mystery Tour has been more readily available than Let It Be, but still. It has this reputation, whether it's deserved or not, as being a mistake or or whatever, because of all of the 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 myths and stories that have grown over the years about how terrible the reception was in England and all. Hmm. And and it a lot of it becomes overblown, much right. like the, you know, much like the um the the myths surrounding let it be. Mm -hmm. I think because, a lot you know, that you know, I think I what you have to keep in mind is the mood in the setting that you see a movie or a TV special in is important. Yes. As I said earlier in this show, Boxing Day, people are drunk, eating a bunch of food, lying on the sofa, expecting a variety show. You know, Andy Williams sings the Christmas songs. You know. And instead, they get that. So the same thing there, let it be. I saw let it be when it first came out. I know you all don't think I look that old or anything. Mm. But to my beard, I skipped, I skipped gray. I went straight to white. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing the film. And going in, I knew the Beatles had broken up. So in my mind, you know, it looks kind of dark and somber. And Why did they break up? Oh, look. George and Paul are having an argument. There's a clue. Who's hmm. Yoko? Why is Yoko that? Ah, maybe she's, you know, and all these things are going through my mind. And so I think that had a bit of a perception on what people thought about that film. Same thing with Magical Mystery Tour. I saw it as a midnight movie. It played in New Orleans at the Robert E. Lee Theater. Oh, God, sometime in the 70s. And, uh, you know, it, this was a theater where you could not have smoked pot, but I'm sure there were a lot of theaters where people were smoking pot. And probably if you smoke pot, it's even better still. But, you know, nonetheless, I've never smoked pot in my life. I know people don't believe me, but never done illicit drugs. I have a client who went to Same the here. grave saying, "You, but you're a big Beatles fan. You must have done drugs because the Beatles were the ruination of Western civilization. But that would be another show we could do. Were the Beatles a ruination of Western civilization or did they save it? Uh, anyway, the, the, mm. the point is, look at us great right ideas now. <laughs> I personally find it to be a pleasant way to pass an hour. Do I think it's as good as a hard day's night? No. Do I think it's as good as help? Honestly, no. But I still enjoy it when I watch it. And I like the things that were in the film that the deluxe edition gave us. But one of the great things about the Beatles is that they didn't want to repeat Ow! themselves. Well, see, excuse me, while you all are talking, I'm going to run and get some Kleenex. I'll be right back. Okay. Keep going. I was saying the Beatles were not the type of group that wanted to repeat themselves. They right. didn't want to do a Hard Day's Night 2. And they could have done that. And they could have done mm -hmm. Help 2. But this was a complete switch. You know, something that was so free form you know, and kind of made up on the spot. And some people find that refreshing. There know, is so one, in, there's one thing, though, that I am curious about on this made up on the spot, spontaneous thing. Yeah. One of the fan recollections I got is a guy who says he has a script, as it were, that he's had since he was a little kid and it was filmed. So uh, we shall see if he and, and I asked him, you know, Gee, I'd love to put that in the book. It's Bruce. I'm working on my own book. You understand. 
<laughs> yeah, I understood, but I would have loved to have seen that. So apparently uh, there were certain things put down. It wasn't entirely spontaneous. Bear in mind, we're dealing with Paul McCartney, rehearsed spontaneity. <laughs> so while I'm sure certain things were spontaneous, Paul, from the very beginning, drew a pie diagram of what that film was going to be like. You know, song, fool on the mm -hmm. hill, question mark. So there were a lot of ideas about it. It wasn't like they got in and you know, had a guy with a camera and went out and had no clue as to what they were doing. That's not true. There were spontaneous things that happened, obviously. Mm. You know, they wanted to have traffic in it. And traffic did a video that when you look at the video, it would have fit in, you know, because mm -hmm. it was shot outdoors and it, you know, it, it would have worked. Sure. But it didn't make the final cut. Um, but, you know, it wasn't totally half-baked. I think and Paul had said when he was on the David Frost show, look, I thought the idea of it being a magical mystery tour, where things happen when you go on when he's on a bus, is enough of a plot. But obviously people didn't think it. They were looking for a real plot. In Paul's mind, the plot was things happen on these bus tours. And we're just showing what could happen. And people dream and, you know, whatever. So Paul underestimated what people were looking for on Boxing Day. And I emphasize that once again, the fact yeah. it was shown on Boxing Day had a lot to do with it. Not just that it was in black and white, but it was shown on Boxing Day. So expectations. Do you, do you think that Magical Mystery Tour deserves a reassessment? Yes, it do. And I think Much it's got a reassessment. Okay. I still hear a lot of negative about it, you know, from, from fans, especially well, the, the, the older fans, well, especially. Uh, again, I think, I think even with the, the older fans and certainly the younger ones, I think again they bought into the whole, you know, this the scenario of oh, it's this terrible, this terrible film, and a lot of them have probably never seen it, and uh, and even the older fans may have seen it many years ago, but uh, may not, you know, may not even own it, and I mean, yeah. So it's, you know, you can't see it on television. You know, mm -hmm. nobody ever runs it on TV. And so you have to at least get a DVD or a Blu-ray uh, and, and play it. Um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of the older fans uh, aren't really interested in doing that. And now, so Apple they, is not going to pay me for what I'm about to say. But yes. for those of you that have had that old guard view and have not seen it, I recommend getting the deluxe Blu-ray edition because yes. it looks and sounds fabulous. And some uh -huh. of the scenes that weren't yep. in it are worth watching. And uh, and you even get, you know, a Hello Goodbye video about the BBC show. They censored the Hello Goodbye video that we saw on the Ed Sullivan show because the Beatles were miming. And the BBC had worked out a deal with the British Musicians Union that, you know, well, we're going to show promotional videos, but they can't be mom. The musicians actually have to be playing. And so the BBC didn't show. It. Instead, they had, fortunately, some black and white footage of the Beatles while they were editing Magical Mystery Tour. And that was kind of interesting. But they mixed yeah. it in with this black and white kind of film of four characters standing outdoor in the snow right. that randomly appear and disappear and around a car. And it's it's truly bizarre, but worth watching. And that's the only way you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about, well, Lady Madonna. Now yeah. you're, you're going, uh, at least to me, completely out of left field from Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour to something which is really back to basics rock and roll and yeah. very Fats Domino-ish to the point where Fats covered the song. Yes. <laughs> and, and being uh, from New Orleans, you know, yeah. you know, my initial reaction hearing it was on the Newman school bus coming home from school. And to me, it sounded like Ringo was singing it. Mm. And I wasn't the only person who thought it sounded like Ringo singing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about that as a wonderful quote in the book where they ask some celebrities what they think about it. And Cilla Black says, well, it sounds like Ringo singing in tune, which I thought was it's kind of cute. Um, but, um, you know, I loved it right away. The Beatles knew it would be seen with that. And at the time, there was this rock and roll revival happening in the UK. Yep. So the timing couldn't have been any better. One of the music critics 
So this isn't like a rehash of, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis that so many lesser bands are doing, but this is sophisticated music from our riotous yesteryears or some quote similar to that. Hmm. I don't have the book in front of me, but it was a great quote and it really drove home the point. Um, and I, I thought it was great. I love the marketing campaign. There's a picture of the ad that EMI ran and Capital ran the same ad and the four Beatles peeking around the side, a side of a door and they have it and they have this text that is very difficult to read, but I'm actually going to read it out of the book because if you look at it carefully, it's a bunch of run on words and I think it's a brilliant ad. Yeah. So I need to find it in the book and I should be able to find it. People think I know where everything is in my books. I don't, but I remember behold, getting that. Here it is. Please. I found it. Yeah. You know, I thought I found it. I haven't found it. Son of a gun. I, I, I have one other place I know it's going to be, and I'll find it there, too. Because uh, it's a brilliant ad campaign that the Beatles do for the song. And, um, and, you know, the Beatles did take an interest every now and then in an ad campaign. And here it is right here. Got a front page ad in the Musical Express. And it says here, a new rock and roll combo direct from Hamburg with the Mercy Beat now on EMI, Lady Madonna, children at your feet, wondering how you managed to make ends meet, see how they run. A fab new release out now on Parlophone. Think about it. When the Beatles first were on EMI, you know, when Please Please Me came out, what were the Beatles? They were a new rock and roll combo direct from Hamburg with mm. the Mercy Beat, now on EMI. And there was an ad in the book has a comparison that was run in early 1963 after Please Please Me had topped the charts. And it has the Beatles saying, you please pleased us. What picture do they use? The four Beatles peeking behind the door in the exact same order that they you know, staged again right. for it. Now, once again, let's make a reference to Get Back Project. What do the Beatles do for the album cover that they would have used? The Beatles duplicating the Please Please Me album cover at EMI House, looking up that stairwell in Manchester Square. Mm. So a brilliant ad. And in the book, I show the two side by side. It's amazing to see how much the Beatles have aged in that five years. They've been, they've been through so much. Mm. Yeah. But, um... So... So let's get back, though, to Lady Madonna, the song itself. Yeah. Great rock and roll song. Paul had said, you know, I got the idea from the National Geographic magazine or what I was reading. So Frank Daniels and I, a few years back, researched and found the actual issue. And we show a picture of it, you know, Mount Madonna, baby, you know, child at her breast is the exact caption. Mm -hmm. and there it is. So that's the lyrical inspiration. The musical inspiration is from a song by Lionel Humphrey called Bad Penny Blues. Right. And the uh, piano is very similar. And the drummer's playing on brushes, just like Ringo does for Lady Madonna. And by the way, like Heather does in the Get Back documentary, where she's playing on Ringo's hi-hat with the brushes. Yeah. One of my favorite little cute Heather scenes. There's so many cute Heather scenes in that. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't it true that Bad Penny Blues wasn't that produced by George Martin? It was on Parlophone and very well may have been produced by George Martin. But I'm not going to say 100% sure, but anything on Parlophone from that time frame, very likely. And actually, it is possible that Bad Penny Blues may have been produced by Joe Meek because he did some work for Parlophone and he oh. did Telstar by the Tornado. So we'll have to look I it can up. cheat and look at my book and see if that's in there or not while we're thinking about it um, but you know obviously a, a wonderful song and i'm sure anything on parlophone george martin had something to do but there is that possibility uh let's see don't say in there but i but i think it's possible that that might have been the case uh, the piano was by johnny parker who played on it hmm. anyway well so it may have been produced by George Martin. I'm not positive one way. I don't want to go out on a limb on it, but certainly George Martin was aware of Bad Penny Blues since mm. it was on his label. Right. At a minimum. It's also interesting sometimes. I love comparing how far songs go on the charts between the UK and the US. Ooh. And here, Lady Madonna only went to number four on Billboard. And you have the different listings when it's Billboard, Cashbox, Record World. Yeah. And... Um, 
But in the UK, it went to number one. Hence, it went to number one, on but I think it got to number two on one of the charts. And in the US, it got to two on Cashbox and Record World, but four on Billboard. Right. Now, it did sell a million copies. So please do not get too angry at me for, you know, for allowing that to happen as a teenager in the U.S. Right. Um, what was it blocked by? Honey by Bobby Goesborough. Oh, right. see the tree, how big it's growing. Hey, hey, hey. I love that song. And it was you one may, of my mom's but I gotta favorite be songs. Honest with you. Okay. I do okay. not like Honey. One of my favorite segments on the Smothers Brothers was they did a takeoff on it the where house. Tommy and Dickie are showing the Honey Museum. And he's giving a tour of it where the honey thing is. And of course, if you look out the window, see the tree, how big it's grown. And anyway, um, it was a really, really great, great takedown of the song. But look, a lot of people like it. Okay. Uh, but also, Young Girl by Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. Right. Yeah. Great. Oh, but great, great song. A box top song, <laughs> Cry Like a Baby, which was a yeah. great song. Uh -huh. yes. That's another great I could have understand that blocking it, but the other two, not so much. But it did, like I said, it sold a million copies. So cut us some slack. Mm. But it is fascinating and, to me. But when you compare the, the UK and the US, sometimes yeah. what the big differences are, because yeah. the last number one single the Beatles had in the UK was the Ballad of John and Yoko, which means that Come Together or something didn't go to number one and Let It Be nope. didn't even go to number one. Let It Be was blocked from the top by Lee Marvin's Wandering Star from the film Paint Your Wagon. Okay, UK yeah. fans. How do <laughs> yeah. you justify that? Strange, strange records uh, you become huge hits in the UK to this day. It's, uh, there's, there's no predicting what's, you know, what's going to become a, a huge trendsetter in, uh, in England. I mean, I mean in, the U in the US, we would never have anything like Disco no. Duck or Convoy be a hit, but yeah, right. mm. beside the point. <laughs> Both number ones. Very oh boy! True. Yeah. Although and, we do uh, need to give, do need to give a shout out though for the for the B side, for oh, uh, the yes. inner life, because especially oh, yeah. especially at that time when you know we really were not you know musically sophisticated enough to really appreciate most of George's Indian influenced uh, material. Uh, that was the I, I, for my for my mind uh, the most accessible of of those of those efforts and in the years since then uh i've grown to absolutely love that song it's just it's just it's so beautiful and it of is. course jeff lynn did such a lovely version of it at the concert for george yeah. sure no i would agree with you al i mean look the beatles are off this is the great thing about the beatles they're rushing off to finally see the Maharishi, they put it off for several months because they had to do Magical Mystery Tour. And then it gets the Christmas holidays. They finally get to see the Maharishi. They rush into the studio and they do Lady Madonna, Across the Universe, The Inner Light, and Hey Bulldog. Give me a yep. break. <laughs> Man. The brilliance just of the Beatles. True. Yeah. In just a Absolutely. short, compressed period of time, what they can come up with. Yeah. Right before they're now, about to do something else. Now are we getting are we getting very near the end of this discussion? We've completely forgotten Yellow Submarine. I was going to go right into that. Good. <laughs> because um, one thing I definitely wanted to know about Yellow Submarine is why there was a four month gap between the UK release and the US release, and an additional month for Canada. Would you happen yeah, to know well, why there was a difference? I'm not entirely sure, but I can point out some interesting things. First of all, the film makes its debut in the UK and the music press sees it first and raves about it. The mainstream press sees it and they rave about it, unlike Magical Mystery Tour. Hmm. Even, you know, not just the Evening Standard, but the London Observer, and, you know, everybody raves about it. And one, I think one or two reviews are talking about the wonderful pop art in it and say that, you know, basically this is better than going to a tour of, you know, the, the hot art galleries because the art is so great in it. And one says it will, you know, it will be loved by children and teen ravers to Tate art gallery goers alike. Mm. So it gets absolute rave reviews in the UK. But here's the weird thing. It gets poor distribution in the theaters 
and it doesn't get mainstream distribution in the theaters in spite of the rave reviews. Why? I don't know. One theater operator said, well, it's certainly no James Bond flick. Okay, I get that. Mm. Bit of foreshadowing because Piers Hemmingson, our Canadian part of the team, writes about his seeing the film on a double bill with on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Mm. Very strange. But anyway, getting, um, you know, that was Let It Be, so not Yellow Submarine. So, but, you know, but the idea, once again, mm. of these films that we see in strange double features. But the, the weird thing is it doesn't get that great distribution. United Artists maybe thought, look, you know, we want to make sure we get proper distribution. And they showed it to, um, to test audiences, although I don't know if the audiences knew they were being tested so much. I think um, Gloria Savers of uh, 16 Mag or Teen Magazine certainly got to see it early. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people got to see it early. And then, uh, you know, some young editors of school newspapers and United Artists wanted to get a feel for what people thought of the film. Based on their audience research, United Artists was concerned that 90 minutes might be too long a film for these people. So they edited out Hey Bulldog to make it 87 minutes long. And that pretty much is what I've heard. That that was because the people who saw it, uh, when I was reading about it, you know, in Teen Set Magazine, talked about the song Hey Bulldog. So Hey Bulldog was in the film initially and United Artists made the decision to take it out perhaps based on audience responses. Go figure. The film in the U.S. makes its debut to a paid audience at the San Francisco International Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And the reviews that are in the book, which you should buy for many, many reasons, when you read those reviews, you're going to be blown away by it. You know, the greatest animation film ever shot, ever produced, ever seen, period. I mean, incredible rave reviews. The Los Angeles Times, rave reviews. The New York Times, great reviews. I mean, everybody in the U.S. raved about it. I could not find Rex Reed's review. I wonder if he reviewed it. I can only imagine what he might have said. But it came out later in the U.S., of course, and got incredible rave reviews. The album did not come out until after the White Album because Paul... Right said he did not want Yellow Submarine to be perceived as the follow-up to Sgt. Pepper. Because in the UK, Magical Mystery Tour was an EP, not an album. So that's mm. why the album comes out later, much later. In the UK and the US in January of 69, which is kind of weird how that happens. So while we're watching, um, or while we're listening to Yellow Submarine, the Beatles are recording, get back. So right. that's strange things happen. Interesting. By the way, I looked up uh, Rex Reed and found out that he lives at the Dakota. I don't know if you're aware of that. <laughs> There's He's a part of us. me that says if he lived in the Dakota in 1980, I wish Chapman would have got someone else. But anyway, I digress. <sighs> and don't and not that I wish ill will of anyone like that. But oh boy. So oh, okay. Rex Reed, you know, I mean, his review of yeah. it magical mystery tour i mean you know repulsive oh come on anyway i digress let's get back to the matter just, at hand i just wanted you know, to i read remember something. seeing it as a kid i loved yeah. it i loved jealous oh, over it's yeah. brilliant it still is you know it's way ahead of its you, time i mean al points out some great things so i'm gonna i'm gonna turn it over to al to hit you with some fun facts about yellow submarine uh for instance <laughs> for instance uh, Children of the Beatles. Oh yeah, uh, I was just gonna. Uh, that was I was just gonna mention that 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 one of the nicest things because of the fact that the uh, the film has had this hugely multi generational appeal over the years. I'm sure Ken, you've probably had the same experience with your with your kids, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and. It was the, I guess, probably the most uh, famous example of, of that is the fact that 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 was how Danny Harrison and uh, uh, and Sean Lennon found out about their father's uh, Beatle past, mm -hmm. which is which is very interesting since they're now uh, basically the you know the kind of like the surrogates of their of their father. That's true. Yeah, I know George so, said. George said that he was wondering 
he didn't want to force the Beatles on Danny, but at some point he knew he'd have to tell him something. But um, Danny discovered Yellow Submarine and thought, you know, isn't that him? Isn't that my dad in there? <laughs> you know, so that was kind of his introduction in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It it was, uh, you know, it, the great thing about some of the reviews in the U.S. were talking about the fact that this will be a timeless classic, a generational thing. I mean, yeah. they nailed it. I mean, you know, it just was an absolute superb film. You know, it was right up there with, you know, The Wizard of Oz and Lord of the Rings. And it came out around the same time as 2001, exactly. which is kind of interesting because uh, there were some people, you know, and making comments about that and the fact that someone had said, I believe that it really helped to be stoned for 2001, but for Yellow Submarine, you didn't need to be, which I thought was kind of an interesting quote. Mm -hmm. Mm. There's exactly. an, actually, there's an ad in your book for Yellow Submarine that reads, the Yellow Submarine in which our British heroes, the Beatles, set out on a colorful fantasy adventure that outdoes the best of Disney. Yes. Yes. Should we send this to Disney Plus? Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm just grateful that, uh, you know, it got the big treatment it deserved when they remastered it and did a fabulous job with the sound and the images and everything about it. And, you know, I, I kind of, I was disappointed that Apple took it out of theatrical uh, circulation because I gave a talk on my book recently in New Orleans and at the theater, of course, we wanted to show Yellow Submarine and even a possible magical mystery tour. And unfortunately, the only Beatles movie available is A Hard Day's Night. It's a Hard Day's Night. Mark yeah. Lapidus at Beatle Fest knows all too well. Mm. Right. <laughs> well, there were Very select true. screenings, select screenings of Yellow Submarine for its anniversary a few years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you could get it, you, you, any theater could show it. Uh, the Britannia Theater in New Orleans, I did. Uh, did a uh, presentation of where we brought in Yellow Submarine and it was great. And then when I did the Britannia Theater again, you know, like last weekend, it wasn't available. And it was a like, darn it, you know, so hard day's mm. night it was. And still there's nothing better than seeing it on the big screen. Oh yeah, I agreed. Mm. I agreed oh, no matter no how question. many times I've seen the film. Uh, and, and when we do the hard day's night show, you know, we've got so many shows <laughs> we're gonna do. One of my favorite hard day's night story, but we're trying, Al and I are really trying to break Peter Jackson's record. Just letting you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. But um, <laughs> I was climbing a, uh, you know, I was, on, was it the Inca Trail or was it climbing Mount Kilimanjaro? I forget which trip. One of these trips, and there were two college students on the trip, female college students. They were doing the climbing, and one of them turns to me and says, Bruce, my uncle told me you're a really big Beatles fan. Would you like to do Hard Day's Night with us? I said, okay. And I thought, we're going to sing a Hard Day's Night. Hmm. These two girls knew the entire script of A Hard Day's Night. They had seen it so yeah. many times on, you know, VHS or whatever. And I mean, I, I could not have done that. I was able to keep up with them. And it's places I knew all the lines. Hmm. But boy, it was it was really that said a lot to me that young people had seen the film so many times they could recite it word for word while climbing a mountain. Go figure. Only with the Beatles. Very true. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe Rocky Horror. So that, that will have to be That's... a fan recollection in my Hard Day's Night book. Hopefully I can track down one of those girls to get her to tell that story. If not, I'll have to tell it because I was freaked out by it. And I wasn't suffering from altitude sickness. They were really doing the entire film. There's plenty of times. Of just, Who's that little old man? I mean, yeah. Whole... Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Amongst my Beatle I'll, I'll friends, bet. we often quote directly from Beatle movies, and our minds think alike. We may not know every line from the movies, but we think of a certain instance where a line applies to something that we're saying, and we, we think of it at the same time. Yeah, and guys, but, how many times have you read in an article on the sports page where a team makes it to the playoffs, and they write about, the team took a long and winding road to make it to yes. the finals. <laughs> Oh, how clever. Yeah. I wish I had thought of that. Thanks. Yeah, really. But I'll bet that there are probably young people, uh, young fans, who can probably quote Yellow Submarine almost yeah. as well as those two girls were with, uh, with The Hard Day's Night. You know, who, One of the things you know, that I love about uh, Yellow Submarine, 
that I inherited from my mom. My mom was a really good punster. And I inherited that from my mom. And Yellow mm. Submarine, visual and audio must have yes. plus puns in it. Loads. I absolutely love the puns in it, you know. Mm. Absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, the school of, you know, the fish come by. A bit old for school. Must be a university. I mean, God, so right. many brilliant puns. <laughs> it's probably some that I still haven't caught on to yet. Yeah, and the bicyclops. I mean, God, there's so <laughs> many great ones. All right. Do you want to comment about the Frank Daniels article on the Beatles and the Stones? I mean, you, we did a bit before, but do you yeah. happen to believe like, you know, like certainly John said and Paul said that the Stones copy them too much? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. no <laughs> yeah, they did. No, but. Yes. <laughs> here, 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 and here's like, here's where some of the no's are. And, and Paul actually gets caught on this one. Paul, you know, look, Al, you're right. Yeah, gee, Sitar and Norwegian wood, Sitar and painted black. But, you know, Paul says, we dress up as magicians and the Rolling Stones dress up as magicians. The yeah. cover for their Satanic Majesty's request was shot around the same time the Beatles were filming Magical Mystery Tour. And there's no way the Rolling Stones know about it because they haven't seen it yet. It's just pure coincidence. That's a coincidence. Um, and obviously, I think except that, except, except that, that the that the Beatles are in the bushes on the on, at least on the three D version. Absolutely, and both versions of it. Yes, mm. on yes. the cover. The what the Stones do is they go to the, the same good people that brought you a Sergeant Pepper cover and say, "Look, we want to do our own thing, but on that grand scale, and we want to go a step further. We want to make it a three D cover." Which don't the Beatles do that fifty years later for Sergeant? Yeah, Pepper? <laughs> right. The Beatles copy the Stones, or is right. it dumb and dumber? The Beatles, yeah, they copied the Monkees. Right. <laughs> and we could do a show on that, but do bear in mind which group first had a song with a Moog synthesizer in it. True. Um, the Monkees. Which yeah, group which, first which had song a song was with a true song harpsichord? In it? Uh, uh, Star Collector, right? Star Collector for the Moog, uh, definitely, and then also Daily Night. And Daily Night, fabulous Daily, yes. piece played yes. by Mickey Dolans, right? And the Beatles use it on Abbey Road, of course, which is after that. And then Here's the Girl something. I Knew Somewhere has a harpsichord, which yes. is prior to the Beatles' use of the harpsichord on was Pickies or whatever. So, mm -hmm. just saying, maybe Dumb and Dumber got it right after all. Just kidding. <laughs> Hmm. But yes, look, I, I think what Frank was trying to point out was that, you know, yeah, they, were, they influenced each other and they forced each other to greater things and all, but it wasn't so much in just a complete copy job throughout by any means. And it was a very friendly rivalry until a little bit later. And it hmm. got to the point where what was Paul's famous remark about, you know, <laughs> no. a blues cover band. Right. Um, but, I think that uh, was that was kind of misinterpreted. In it a way. was, but I will tell you where Mick got a little bit PO'd at Paul, and that was the listening party for Beggar's Banquet. And they have this album and they're sitting around a club listening to it. And Paul says, Oh, I got a still a single. And Paul puts on Hey Jude and Revolution. Okay, what was that Stones <laughs> album again? <laughs> yeah, kind of overshadowed it. Just a yeah, bit. in spite of the brilliance of that album, you know, Hey Jude and Revolution, you might kind of forget about Salt of the Earth after hearing those two. Mm. Mm. And also, I think that John said that when the Stones did Miss You, they were copying Bless You. And I don't even hear it, John's song, Bless no. You. Not either. That's what he's hearing in his head. So yeah, yeah that's that's okay. But look, it, it really was in the early days, certainly a friendly rivalry. Hmm. And uh, and then look, they had mutual respect for each other. The Rolling Stone Rock and Roll Circus. John was invited to be there. What about using strings from yesterday to as tears go by? Well, as tears go by, sure. Oh well, yeah, you know. And what and you know, Keith Richard dreams about the riff and satisfaction paul dreams about the riff or this you know the melody for yesterday i mean they're, they're, 
great musical minds work alike. I don't know. But I thought it was a fascinating piece. And, and the, I love the picture that we were able to license from the Beatles book mm. was sort of Paul holding up the Aftermath album cover, reading the yep. back liner notes to it. Mm. So okay. just another fun bit of information in that book. Yeah. Okay. That blooming book. <laughs> well, this has been great talking about uh, everything that followed Sgt. Pepper, even before Sgt. Pepper with you yeah, guys. And and, and there are a few things, though, that I do have to, to bring home in points. And um, when I give my presentation, hopefully at the next Fest for Beetle fans. Mm -hmm. that Fingers tightly be crossed. Able, yes. And toes. I end my talk yes. by pointing out, and I also have it in the book as well, that the first song released from the post-pepper period is All You Need Is Love, which is broadcast throughout the world via satellite. The last song released from that project is beamed across the universe 40 years to the day after it was recorded. Hmm. And I find that pretty cool. Mm. The other thing, and I would be remiss if I didn't not only plug the Magical Mystery Tour book, which you can get at, you know, beetle.net. And the reason that you should get it from my website is if you get it directly from my website, I autograph all the books. And I also would be happy to personalize them. And yes, if you get it at Amazon or Barnes and Noble and you see me at the fest, I will do the same. Um, but also, you know, when I sell a book directly, I make a lot more money than if I'm paying the middlemen. And I appreciate people who realize they may be able to get it cheaper at Amazon and the like, but it makes it possible for us to do the books and price it, you know, at the way we price it because color books are still very expensive to do. So we do appreciate it. The collector's editions also, it comes with um, a wonderful poster that has the lobby cards from Yellow Submarine. And it has two Eric Cash illustrations that aren't in the book. One of my favorites of his, the Yellow Submarine, and another one that he did, especially for the book, uh, which of course you can buy from him, of uh, the Beatles in their animal costumes playing together. And so the collector's editions are a lot of fun. Uh, let it be... The book that I did was called The Beatles Finally Let It Be, which was a bit of a joke because at the time I kept reading in Rolling Stone about, you know, when the movie was finally going to come out. So I go ahead and I put my book out. And of course, the book ends up because of COVID coming out well in advance of the Peter Jackson film. So I mm. can't review the Peter Jackson film in the book. I can't say a word about it or the Let It Be box set. So instead, I put together a 12 page supplement covering those releases. And that supplement is absolute free for download on the site beetle.net. Not that you have to purchase anything. It's absolute free to anyone in the world who wants to download it. So for those of you watching it out there, and we're gonna tie it into the, uh, let the Get Back film. There's a guy in London that's asked about the concert. He's, well, it's nice to get something for free for a change, isn't it? This is something you can get for free free download there you go so uh you know and it, you know if i don't plug my books the uh the author's union you know gets really mad at me so i do <laughs> have to plug the books but i figure if al and i have been talking now for about whoa gee approaching two hours of time i should be able to plug the books and also to personally thank al for the wonderful articles that he has done in all of my books and thank i you, think sir. as much Appreciate as i have enjoyed working with al on them in finding images to go with them. The one that will be in the next book, a little bit of a teaser, in that next book, Al, I think, really outdid himself. And it's a really great article in that one and look forward to that one. And, and who knows, Ken, maybe you'll be able to get me to come on the show sometime in January and announce what the next book will be. If you twist my arm, maybe, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I'd consider it. You know, I was just reminded of something, and this is actually something that I've said in, in my podcast shows, and this is just a theory that I have, and you can give me your opinion on this, okay? Because your books have come out around the times when these archival box sets have been coming out, and it's a glaring omission in these box sets, especially, let's take a look at um, the Sgt. Pepper box set. Only a Northern song was recorded and proposed for that album and wasn't put in there yep. as a bonus track. Um, 
the other songs from Yellow Submarine, recorded before Sgt. Pepper, with the exception of Hey Bulldog, not in Sgt. Pepper. In the White Album box set, you've got Lady Madonna and the Inner Light and Across the Universe, but you don't have Hey Bulldog. No. And so with all the other Magical Mystery Tour stuff, with the exception of Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, all that still remains. So yeah. it's been my theory, right or wrong, that the next box set would be what you are covering in your book, which is Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. I think it would make a fabulous box set. Um, you know, if, if Apple had come to me and said, Bruce, what do you think we should do? That would have been on my list. And I would have told them, don't put the inner light and Lady Madonna and across the universe with the White Album. It doesn't belong there. Hmm. It belongs with the Magical Mystery Tour, Yellow Submarine songs, as I have done in this book. Now, am I mad at Apple for putting it there? No. Who's going to object to some extra Beatles songs that may or may not should have been there? Mm. I was glad to get yet another version of Across the Universe, which I may be wrong on this, but I think there are more released versions of Across the Universe than any Beatles song, which if that is the case, it would be extremely ironic because, bear in mind, this was a song John Lennon rejected, and when it was first released, it wasn't on a Beatles album. It was on a charity album called No One's Going to Change Our World. Right. How yeah. is that for irony? I know. Very true. And all, all the, the other versions that came out after the Let It Be album, the more stripped down ones, Let It Be Naked, the one on uh, Beatles Anthology, and the one on the White Album box, which are all very similar. They're all just stunning and just gorgeous they are. the way they are. And, and my least favorite version of Let It, I mean, of Across the Universe, is on the 1970 Let It Be album. I think Giles yep. Martin and Sam O'Kell have improved it immensely because rather than getting a murky wall of sound, mm -hmm. the symphony yep. instruments now sound like a separate instrument. And I absolutely love it. Is it my favorite? No, my favorite, True. ironically, is yet to be released. Bootleg people out there. It's the one called the wild uh, humming version, the wild humming version of it. They'll know what I'm talking about. It's one that you can read about in this book but wasn't released. And that is my favorite version by far. I have it on a bootleg. Absolutely love it. But I, how can you have a bad version of it? I mean, even the 1970 version I don't like is pretty darn good. So, but that is my least favorite. And thank you, Giles and Sam, for making it much more listable. I do appreciate that. I love all the versions except for the first one. <laughs> the spin Yeah, you like me. Was, yeah. Mm. Anyway. You know. So, um, Give us uh, like a status of all your books and how many of them are still available? Are, are some of them just a PDF? How does that work? Yeah, uh, there are now 13 books, not counting the price guide, which I edited. So 13 books. The VJ book and the two capital books, those were the first three books I did. They have sold out and go on secondary markets anywhere from one to three, four or five hundred dollars or more. Uh, those are available in digital PDF. Hmm. They are revised and expanded editions. Even if you have those books, I recommend you get the digital because it has a lot of cool stuff that's not in the other you know, print books. I know there's nothing like holding a print book, but guys, there's no reason why you can't have both. Uh, the Apple book is sold out. I've started doing a digital version of it, and I've just been doing too many other things to get to it. One day I'll get that done. The uh, Swan book has sold out. Uh, maybe one day there'll be a digital version of that, but it is sold out now. The Beatles are coming is still available, but that, you know, who knows how long that'll be around. But uh, the Beatles solo book is now down to about 400 copies, and that'll take about a year or two at most to sell out. So for those of you out there, grab the solo book now while you can get it at very reasonable prices, particularly Beatle.net. You can get it at half price if you don't mind a slightly scuff cover. Uh, let's see, uh, the Polyphone book. I knew I was forgetting something. That was a book that Frank Daniels made me do. Frank said, Bruce, nobody in the UK has put out a book like this. Someone has to. I think you and I should do it. Frank practically put a gun to my head and made me do it. That was going to be my last book. And then I got the idea to write a really in-depth article, just an article for Sergeant Pepper. And I thought about it. And I thought the article is too long for Beatle fans. 
Bill will put it in two or three parts. Um, hmm. Bill will not give me color pictures at Beetle Fan throughout. Right. Sure. Nobody will. And I thought, you know, I could put out my own magazine. And thought, wait a minute, Bruce, you don't know how to put out a magazine, but you know how to put out a book. And I thought for me to do this, I'm going to need help from people because I don't have time to do it by myself. And that's when I turned to Bill King and Al Sussman and Frank Daniels and Pierce Hemmingson. And that's how we got the team. And we've kept the team for every book. I love working with these guys. They're great to work with. They don't mind me editing their pieces. You know, I have one time where Pierce said, Bruce, I don't want you to use that particular image because you may not realize this, but this might be offensive to some Canadians. And of course, I changed it. Um, but everyone's been great to work with in the fan recollections. What, what can you say about it? Mm. You know, I try to limit it to you know, a reasonable amount, um, you know, and I'm sure some people will say, well, there, there might be one or two too many, whatever, but I try to hit the right balance of it. In every book, you get some good stuff. I have one person who was reviewing the Beatles finally let it be book. And he said his favorite part of the book were the four fan like recollections in a row from the rooftop where I had Ken Mansfield you know, Chris O'Dell, Kevin Harrington, who held the lyrics and put right. the equipment up. And one from, you know, a girl who lovely refers to a lovely person who refers to herself as Beetle Tripper, who was happened to be in the crowd that day in the street below. And you have Chris O'Dell talking about, I looked down to see the crowd. One of my favorite little scenes in the Peter Jackson documentary is the Beatles shown walking up to the ledge and looking over. Even Ringo gets up from his drum kit to walk to the ledge and look down at the crowd below. What a wonderful moment in that film. Yeah. I think I think Paul's the only one that didn't do that. Yeah, well, he may have. We just don't have it on camera. Yeah. Who knows? Huh. But uh, absolutely, you know, Beetle.net is the website. And also I have an archive of some of the articles I've written over the years for Beetle Fan, Goldmine Magazine, and various other things, American History Magazine, and things like that. It's It's, you know been a magical mystery tour of life of my own in that and you know for a guy who does you know i'm a tax attorney i know that sounds boring <laughs> and at times it can be but i will say this the skills that i learned as a tax attorney and as a cpa i've been able to use in my research so much and i attack my books the same way i attack a lawsuit i first do what in law we call discovery which in writing we call research you're reviewing mm -hmm. documents, you're interviewing people, same thing for a lawsuit. We start writing it up. And sometimes we change it because of what we discover is we're writing it up. And we want to write it up in a way that a judge or a jury will understand the presentation. Same thing I'm doing here. I want to make sure an everyday person can read my book and know exactly what I'm talking about. So I, I think the skills that I have as an attorney and a CPA made me uniquely qualified to do these types of books and having the good sense a couple of years ago to hook myself up with Pierce Hemmingson and Al Sussman and Bill King and Frank Daniels and to turn it open to the fans themselves and say, I want to hear your fan recollections. I never would have known about the UCLA campus screening and how many people mm. would have known about that? Only a handful because many people were there were probably stoned and forgot about it. But fortunately, some you know, some guy who reads my book and is on my website and sees I'm asking for fan recollection sends it, and now it's opened up to so many more people. So, you know, it's it's been great putting the team together, and it's been wonderful to do a show. And I, I still think we need to do a Zoom thing with the entire team sometime. That would be Absolutely. that would be fun to put together. Right here. Yeah, and I, I should mention. Yeah, and I should mention that uh, Bruce talks about his archive of articles. I, I should mention that a lot of people are, are, may not be aware that generally, in most cases, Bruce has at least one article in each issue of Beetle Fan, and a lot of uh, a, a goodly number of those articles are fresh material that is not in that isn't yeah. excerpted from his books. Yeah. Mm. So it's, you know, it's, it's been a, a great partnership working with Al and, and Bill. And I, I always love being able to send Bill an email and say, I need something on this. And then Bill like, well, when do you need it by? So it's, it's kind of fun flipping the, uh, flipping the coin on Bill. You know, yeah. Bill, I need it by such and such a date. Kind mm -hmm. of fun to do that for a change. Well, thank you, Bruce, for all the wonderful work you've done through the years and keep them coming. And, uh -huh. um, 
like you said, beetle.net for all this material that you mentioned. And, and I and, will tell you the next book at this point in time, I need to edit two more sections, which I have not received yet. I've got Nals already and it's brilliant. And then I need to open up the fan recollections and I will probably in January make the announcement of what the book will be. And then that way people can start sending in the fan recollections. But the book is about, I would say about 80% complete as we speak. Okay, very good. And the plan is to have it out in the fall. Al, what's going on with you? Um, aside from working with Bruce's books, you have a Absolutely. new article coming in uh, Beetle Fan? Uh, well, the, the, in the current issue uh, of Beetle Fan, there's a, a fairly extensive piece that you, that you saw uh, prior to our uh, talk with uh, Tom Frangione just recently mm. uh, on uh, kind of talking about the basically the history of the whole Get Back, Let It Be project. Although uh, there, there are a few, a few little things in there that I'm going to have to correct. Mm. Uh, you know, having seen the, uh, you know, having seen Get Back, uh, some things that we didn't really know about. That, yeah, uh, this, this, that, one, that, that that, this is an important one for me to bring up because it all ties into Yellow Submarine as well. When I did the Beatles on Apple book, I went ahead and put my neck on the chopping block as Frank Daniels helps me do sometimes by saying, Bruce, right. I think you're right. I've been thinking the same thing. Uh, I maintained in that book that Yellow Submarine was not the third United Artists film, even though when it was remastered and released, Bruce Marco, who was involved in it, said it was. And everyone has always said it was. Al Brodak said it was. I interviewed David Picker, who was president of United Artists, and David Picker told me no freaking way. He said, the Beatles came to us with it. And we looked at it and said, this is a cartoon where the Beatles are in it for about 90 seconds. You owe us a film. Mm -hmm. And so, but he said, we would love to distribute it. And that's why when you saw the film back in 68 or 69, it opened up with the blue U for United Artists. How many people remember that? That's ingrained mm -hmm. in my head as much yeah. as Paul sitting behind the microphone and singing the first two words of Hey Jude. But I digress. And I, w I went ahead and said it was not the third film. Let It Be was the third film. John in this talks about the fact that one of the scenes in there says, you know, TV special, this could be a film this could be the third film. And John comes out and says it. It's there and let it be if you look, or get back if you look for it. So once again, more proof that the third film owed to United Artists was Let It Be. It's kind so, of ironic how, how what was supposed to be a TV special became a yeah. film instead. Yeah, and, and yeah. I thought that it was Alan Klein's idea, yet the Beatles, yeah. Yeah. John's talking about it earlier, and George exactly. says, you could make six films out of it. Your Jackson yeah. made three. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we, uh, could, we could do this for out. We could break Peter Jackson's record, guys. But yeah, uh, we're on really? the way. <laughs> and I have a beard. You have a beard? So do <laughs> Al, could I do. you grow a Al, Well, if you can do this long I mean, enough, Al will grow a beard. Yeah, exactly. It's It's on the way. <laughs> So I was saying the next Beatle fan, are you planning uh, an article for that? Because you have one in every, uh, every issue. Just about. Yeah. Um, um, uh, I, well, Bill had asked me to do to put together some quick thoughts since Brad Hunt uh, is doing the, uh, the main review of Get Back. Uh, Bill asked me to put together some quick, uh, some quick you know, thoughts on uh on, on the three episodes and uh uh which is why i need to get uh, the you know be able to watch it completely with without taking notes and things like that um so i i uh send a it's a short piece uh and i think um i don't re re remember there may be something else in hmm. that issue it's uh yeah. you know and, uh, been, in, in my been, 50 years ago series i write about the john lennon christmas single yes and of course the uh, album release 
of the concert for Bangladesh. Okay. Right. Very nice. You guys want to just uh, have some quick thoughts right now about Get Back as we close? Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. I loved it. My main and only criticism, and it's a criticism not as a filmmaker, but as a true lover of music, I wish there were more complete performances of the songs. You know, we get a, a wonderful snippet of this or that, and I want to hear the whole performance. And I can do that for the most part on bootleg. Uh, my, you know, for instance, I lost my little girl. I love that. The whole thing. I think it's great mm. uh, because I love you. So I love that too. You know, you, the, for the listeners of the weaklings, that's where they got it from in case you were wondering. Yes. Sure. Now, the other thing about that uh, for complete performances, um, you know, one that he has that if Peter Jackson and Giles Martin had come to me and said, Bruce, is there anything that you noticed in listening to 83 CDs of Get Back that we absolutely have to do? I would have said, yes, there's one thing. During the session for two of us, John and Paul are on their acoustic guitars, of course, and they do Bye Bye Love. And it sounds horrendous. Why? Because George is doing the bass line parts. He's practicing for two of us. And Ringo's practicing his drum part for two of us. And it sounds horrendous. But Mark Lewison's book says that's on the A track, which means, Giles, you can mix out George and Ringo and give us John and Paul doing, just like the Nerd Quins, Bye Bye Love on acoustic guitar. Please do it. Guess what? It's there. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Love it. My other big criticism, and not meant in a mean way, because I understand why he did it. He decided the film would be strict chronological. One of the problems with strict chronological is the climax of the film is the rooftop session. And the next day, the Beatles are in the basement and they do Two of Us, Long and Winding Road, and Let It Be. Brilliant performances. My second favorite part of the Let It Be film. And Michael Lindsay Hogg solves that problem by doing it before the rooftop concert. Until Lewison's book, we didn't know any better. Yeah. Well, Peter Jackson can't do that. So instead, he knows it ain't going to work, folks. So over the closing credits, he has a snippet or two of take this hammer five feet and rising and stuff like that. Run for your life. Little snippets of that. And then a little bit of two of us. And then a little bit of Long and Driving Road. And then one of my favorite outtakes, you know, when the song breaks down and John and Paul kind of do some little bit of cursing and a little bit of fake German. But you don't get those three songs in full performances. It is, as I describe in the supplement, which you can download for free, so please do so. Or you can buy it in print if you want for five bucks. What it does, as I say in there, it's understandable and disappointing. However, the good news is Apple is supposed to release a remastered version of the film Let It Be, where we'll be able to sit back and watch those three songs in a row. Hmm. So those are my comments. Brilliant. Love it. Wish the song performances were more complete. So be it. As a film person, I get it. As a and music in the lover, mean, I would have loved it. And in the meantime, uh, the the clips of Let It Be and Long and Winding Road are available on the uh, the One Plus uh, Blu-ray. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, two of us isn't on there. Yeah. My only criticism is that I, I really wish that the rooftop concert was just the Beatles, not mixed with, you oh. know, people on the street. No, I think that that was yeah. done brilliantly, but it I was. think that that should be like a bonus track that way on the DVD. Yeah, I would, when I, I read about it before <clears throat> I saw it, I really have my doubts. And watching it, it works. It's yeah. brilliant. So right. I'm going to give him an A-plus on that segment. I would not be upset if the home version had, and, and this Tom Frangione and I talked about that th this morning, hmm. uh, where you have the option, because you can do a lot with Blu-ray, to pick which camera you want to watch. Mm -hmm. So you can watch what Peter Jackson did, or you could watch just the roof, or you could watch from across <clears throat> the street looking bird's eye view, or whatever. I think that would be great to have those different viewing options. Peter Jackson, Disney, if you're listening, would love to see that. Okay, great ideas.
Is there is what did you like most about it, Al? Or is, is there any criticism that you have of the documentary? Well, well, I mean, the visually, it's just amazing because I because I had watched I had taken out my old uh, uh, bootleg uh, DVD of uh, of Let It Be and uh and, and had watched that and oh my god um the difference is just just amazing especially the twickenham uh scenes yeah you know, which it's like somebody so... flipped the switch Ooh, yes now, i knew i knew it was going to be like that sure why did i know it was going to be like that they shall not grow old i remember seeing yes peter jackson world war one documentary yeah. peter jackson to give you an idea of how brilliant he and his crew that he has down in New Zealand are, he took out of sync World War II black and white, what, grainy, flickering World War One. thank you, well, footage from 100 years ago, more or less. He made it in color look brilliant. So I figured 50-year-old, 16-millimeter color, no problem. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was great. I thought the sound, once again, you know, a tip of the hat to Giles and Sam O'Kell, uh, you know, did a great job on the sound of it. So visually, what did I love best? Quite frankly, uh, I've already said it. The Everly Brothers uh, version of, you know, Bye Bye Love with John and Paul is high on my list. Uh, Ringo getting from behind his drum kit to look down in the crowd and learning some things I didn't know. I didn't know yeah. that we were talking about a film that early. And also, why did we never know that the Beatles were planning an outdoor concert at Primrose Park? Yeah. I had no idea. Yet there they were talking about Primrose Park. I had to get out my laptop while I was watching it and Google Primrose Park. It has a beautiful, it's up on a hill. You look down and you can see, you know, the region area. It's by the London Zoo and it has a beautiful view of a London skyline. So when somebody who has listened to 83 hours of stuff, can learn something new from a film, that's really cool. Very well, not only that, Very when true. you're watching the Beatles perform these songs that you've only heard on audio, yeah. it's a completely different yeah. experience because you're seeing the interaction sure. of them. How yeah, the absolutely. looks on their faces. And, and and for those people, for those people who, for whatever reason, are bored by uh, you know at least parts of the of the film, especially the the second and third episodes, you are watching the only only full um, uh, long form documentary footage of the Beatles recording in a studio. There yeah. is nothing else. No, mm -hmm. experiment you know. a TV with Hey Jude. Yeah, which 10 is minutes. It's extremely short. It's brilliant. Yes. If the original footage from that exists, get it to Peter Jackson and let him do yeah. a, you know, <laughs> our show on Hey Jude. I'll be the first to sign up for that one. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think Alice hit that point. And, you know, and the other thing, there are people that say, well, you know, why did the... Uh, you know, the Beatles release all these rock and roll tunes and how come there aren't more rock and roll tunes in the movie? The performances are pretty bad, to be perfectly yeah. candid. Mm -hmm. But there are some good ones and the film has some of the good ones, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that aspect, um, you know, if I had been down in New Zealand with Peter Jackson, I would have done a few things differently, but it mainly would have been of saying, Peter, we really, we need the full eight hours. You know, I know you told him six hours and you're like, you know, Two tenths of an hour short of eight hours. Let's get it to eight hours by doing this. <laughs> but I'd have had to quit practicing law for a year or two. Yeah. Tell me what that it'd have been worth it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this: this has been the most mesmerizing thing I've seen on the Beatles, because yeah. just to see, just to see a song take shape, get back, yeah, yeah, and, to see Paul and, in know, the very beginning when he's just yeah. coming up with the idea. Yeah, yeah. So it was fun about it. Look. There's, I wish he had shown a little bit more of it. We see Paul plugging in his bass, which is really mm -hmm. cool. And then we see him riffing and he gets him to get back. What we miss from the film, and I know from the bootlegs, is initially he's riffing on it and he's doing, uh, you know, tell me what I say, tell me what I say. Mm -hmm. And then he does a, boy, you got to carry that way. It's, right. it's really yeah, cool. That's amazing. You know, 
Yeah. And, and I wish he had included those 20, 30 seconds, but still, you know, you get him plugging in his bass and you see the birth of one of the Beatles' biggest hits in the U.S. get back. Right. Yeah. Certainly one of their top five in the U.S. without a doubt. Maybe not so much in the U.K., but maybe so. I mean, you know, Get Back clearly sold over two million copies when it was released as a single. And, you know, that's a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. I want to hold your hand and she loves you. Maybe sold more, but not many others. Hey, yeah. June, you know. Five weeks in number one here on Billboard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But was it unusual, you know, the way that Paul was playing the bass? He was strumming it. Strumming it like, yeah, it was very unusual, but it, it worked really well. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think that's the note we go out on, you know, because I know Al and I and you and probably we need to get back to other things we need to be doing tonight. Yes, but, we do. Yeah, we, you know, we didn't break Peter Jackson's <laughs> right. record, but we gave it a run for the money. And quite frankly, right. he deserves the record. Okay. But Absolutely. you're going to have to get closer and closer to it. Next show, we'll there make it go. like, you know, three hours. There you go. All what right. What do you say? <laughs> yeah. I'm stealing right, Al tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce and Al, thanks so much for doing this. Oh, and, thank you, Ken. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to my channel. And uh, we will see you very soon. Take care. Go to Beetle.net. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.